Hello YouTube, Ash from RetroTug here and today I want to answer the question how good is Battlefront 2? Um, firstly I just want to say that my focus on this video is not going to be the microtransactions, pay to win arguments or progression linked to loot boxes. Um, I'm obviously against all of them but uh, there's already so much content on YouTube uh, covering that topic that I want to focus more on the game itself. So uh, let's begin. I remember the first Battlefront uh, EA and DICE released about two years ago and after soaking in the Star Wars sounds and the stunning visuals there was an overall hollowness to the game. It didn't have much depth to it. Uh, so has Battlefront 2 improved on the original? Well I can honestly say that yes it has. Immediately when you enter the game and start looking through the main screens in your collection you can see that a lot more attention has been paid to player progression and it's clear that EA and DICE despite EA winning multiple awards for being one of the worst companies in the world have really tried to listen to fan feedback after the last Battlefront. So let's go into player progression into more depth. You have four different classes, Assault, Heavy, Officer and Specialist. Each class has three abilities which can be used in game and in addition to this each class has three star card slots which can be filled with a variety of cards that either change your standard three abilities or enhance some aspect of your class. So far so good. It's a neat little system that allows for a good variety of options for each class. You also have the option of different guns which unlock as you play the game or specifically as you get more kills in that particular class. However, where this all begins to fall down is the progression system used to open and unlock the star cards for each class. It feels clunky to me and I hope once I explain it you'll see why. So, each star card can be leveled up, each class can be leveled up and your overall player profile has a ranking level as well. Your star card level can be upgraded levels 1 through 4 using crafting material which you get from loot boxes and your class level is equal to the total number of levels for all your star cards you own for that particular class. Your profile level is increased by playing in multiplayer games. Now for me, one of the fundamental principles of progression is picking a class and loadout you enjoy and maxing the hell out of it so you can perform at the peak of your ability with your favourite weapons. Here's where it starts sucking though. You can only level up your favourite card when you've reached certain milestones in both your profile level and your class level. So you're forced to spend your hard earned crafting material levelling up cards you don't want and probably won't use in order to raise your class level high enough to be able to level up your favourite cards. This is compounded by the small amount of crafting material you get from loot boxes. And what makes this even worse is that when buying the trooper loot box you only have a 1 in 4 chance of even getting a card for the class that you want. And that's if you don't get a duplicate which seems to happen a ridiculous amount of the time. You buy the trooper loot box for the trooper star card and it costs 4000 credits. If you get a duplicate card you get back about a tenth of the amount you spent on the loot box which is no recompense at all and it just makes you feel that you've completely wasted the 4000 credits that you've earned. So as I said, very clunky. But let's move on to the gameplay. How does the game play and feel? Well, you do get the same audio visual childlike buzz from the first Battlefront. That feeling where you're holding a gun that makes the exact Star Wars gun noise that you love from the films. The visuals are stunning. Some of the cutscenes are worthy of the films themselves. The music is just as inspiring and rousing. But I have to admit, we got that in the old Battlefront. It's nice to feel it again, but it's expected of a Battlefront game now. Show me something new. Let's start with the multiplayer. Multiplayer has familiar game modes in Galactic Assault and Heroes and Villains. It also has the truly excellent and long awaited Starfighter Assault game mode which is incredible. The lack of space battles in the original Battlefront was something that was heavily criticised as half of the major battles in the films happened to be in space and it felt like we were missing out by being restricted to using TIE Fighters and X-Wings in the lower atmosphere of multiplayer maps. Well, rest easy Star Wars fans, because Starfighter Assault delivers in spades. Usually based around a specific objective, like an ambush on a Star Destroyer, the space battles are intuitive and very fun to play. They have a theatricality to them which is partly produced by the amazing scenery, partly by the pace of the battles, but mainly because of the introduction of NPCs. The NPCs ensure that the three-dimensional battlefield feels more like an epic space battle. They are stunning visual treats and because of these NPCs, even an unskilled player can easily rack up enough points to get to play a hero like Boba Fett's Slave 1 or Han and Chewie's Millennium Falcon. These hero vehicles are perfectly balanced as well. They are strong enough that when you're flying one you can dominate all who are in front of you. But they're just weak enough that a skilled player sat behind say the Millennium Falcon can kill them off with a sustained bit of skill for flying. 
All the elements combined make the Starfighter Assault the most enjoyable game mode on Battlefront by far. It's quite telling in fact that it's the only aspect of the game not handled by EA and DICE. It was farmed out to Criterion Games, so really well done to them. In fact, there have been a lot of calls for the Starfighter Assault being made into a separate game. It's that good. For me, the standout in this field has always been the marvellous X-Wing vs TIE Fighter. And although Starfighter Assault definitely brings that same feeling back to me, I think if they were to make a standalone game of Starfighter Assault, it could potentially rival that old classic. Playing Starfighter Assault was an absolute treat, and I hope more is done with it as expansions come out. The new points-based system for getting heroes is a welcome one. On the previous Battlefront, it was entirely random as to who got to play the heroes as the buffs were simply left on the ground for people to stumble across. This time, as you play in a match, you accumulate points which you can spend on respawning as a particular hero. Whilst this system is a lot better than the previous randomness, it does produce negative results in some instances, as you'll see in a moment. Galactic Assault hasn't changed too much from its previous iteration. It is still objective based and what's nice to see is that the objectives change style within the same match. So for example the first objective might be capturing and holding two points and once this is accomplished the next objective might be a king of the hill style holding an area for a certain amount of time. This change is very positive as it shakes the match up and a team that is bad at defending or attacking a certain type of objective might then be able to turn around on another. One criticism however is spawn points. They are so far away from any objective that if you are playing against a group of players that are high, higher in skill or simply more coordinated, you'll feel that, like you're just playing a Star Wars running simulator as you respawn, run to the objective and instantly die with no impact on the game as it's so far away, rinse and repeat. Another change that has been made which I don't particularly like is the map limits continually shift as the objectives progress and anyone caught outside of these limits is killed if they don't retreat in time. The effect it has is that it makes the battlefield feel a lot smaller than it is. You'll also get occasions where the enemy will camp inside an area that you can't run to without dying. I don't see the point in having these big expansive maps if you're going to limit where you can go within the map for each objective. One of the abilities of the specialist class is to go invisible to infiltrate enemy lines. Well if they're camping inside their spawn zone where you can't enter, that makes the entire ability pretty much redundant. Another unfortunate downside of these zones shifting is that if you get into a heated battle as a hero and the zones suddenly shift, you are forced to retreat and most likely get killed, as you can see this happening to me as Yoda. I saved up my backup points for the entire match because, let's face it, I'm not an expert player, I have to admit, but I finally got to play as Yoda. I ran toward the objective that we were losing, got into a battle, didn't spot the fact that we had lost the objective as I was so immersed and then when I realised that I had to retreat it was too late. So my time with the hero was very short indeed, very frustrating. One of the best points about the Galactic Assault game mode in the original Battlefront was the map design. The two teams would focus around three or four choke points at multiple stages of the match and the best strategy was to overload one of these and then flank the enemy which you naturally seem to do when you're playing with uh, complete randomers online. Playing Galactic Assault on Battlefront 2, you feel that this was dropped entirely in favour of wider, open spaces with various places to take cover dotted around the map. Now whilst this would normally promote good tactical thinking in order to win, unfortunately it is hindered by the squad spawn system. At the start of the match and after each death you are stuffed into a new squad with random people who happen to be spawning at the same time as you. This means that you have no time to construct any cohesive strategy with your squad and it also means that sometimes if the timer runs out you can also be in a one man squad all on your own. How in the world is that supposed to encourage teamwork? Now ordinarily I would still just applaud the attempt and leave it at that. But this shit is simply not good enough. You know why? Because EA and DICE still have a game out now that has a near perfect squad system. It's called Battlefield 4. Battlefield 4 showed the world how much can be accomplished simply by forcing players to play together. For example, here I am on Battlefield 4 taking out a nest of snipers with my squad of random but the same people. We didn't talk or communicate in any way, one of us just headed there first and because we could choose to spawn with our squad we all worked together to accomplish the same goal. It is so depressing that EA and DICE have got it wrong after they have already got it right four years prior. 
What this all leads to is a poor experience on Galactic Assault. People rarely work together to achieve anything, and if anyone is paired up with friends online, and they do work together to take objectives, they're going to win about 90% of the time. Heroes vs Villains makes a return, and is tweaked from just an all-out team deathmatch. Instead, in flowing mini-rounds, each team has a specific target to kill on the opposition team, which adds an element of tactical thinking into the mix. Each team has to balance attacking the target with defending the ally being targeted. Whilst the change is a welcome one as it adds a new dimension to the Heroes vs Villains game mode, there are still fundamental flaws which drag the game mode down. Firstly, lightsaber combat has not been improved since the previous Battlefront. There is no reliable way to block incoming strikes of an enemy lightsaber, so combat devolves into just button mashing to rinse off the enemy's health before they take yours down. And if you're in a 2v1, you can pretty much forget winning that battle. Your best bet is to run away until your odds are better. The only real skill comes in timing your abilities. There are also serious balance issues in my opinion. The dark side abilities appear to be drastically overpowered, and a team consisting of Darth Maul, Darth Vader and Kylo Ren can easily cut through any opposition if they're working together. It would be interesting to see what the stats actually are in terms of which side wins more often, but the dark side winning is what I experienced in the main. There are also two other multiplayer game modes, Blast and Strike. Blast is your Call of Duty imitation game mode, fast pace, small map, ridiculous spawn points. Nothing to write home about. Strike should be more fun than it actually is. Small groups pitted against each other to complete some form of objective, but even now, a few days after the release at the time of this recording, you can see that it is already a breeding ground of people standing around doing nothing but cashing in on credits to try and pay for the high-priced unlocks. Strike also suffers from the same issues that Galactic Assault does, in which that if the enemy team doesn't feel like pushing the objective, they can just camp around their spawn point where you're not allowed to go. Of course, they won't win the game like that, but it happens so often that it just spoils your experience. So, now we move on to the single player campaign. So... SPOILER ALERT! SPOILER ALERT! Yes, that's right, I am going to be talking about it in detail, so if you don't wish to have the details of the campaign spoiled for you, I will make a note below of what time to move the video to in order to skip the spoilers. But, you have been warned. So at the very start, you are thrusted into the world of Iden Versio, an elite stormtrooper fighting for Inferno Squad, the Empire's special ops team. The campaign begins really well, and you get a sense of release as finally you are playing a game as the Empire, and are slaughtering rebels left, right and centre. There are interesting mechanics where you toy with stealth, uh, or also have the option of blasting your way through, but the map is linear, so whilst you have the black or white choice of how to approach the level, you don't have the choice of which way you go. Playing as Iden for these first few missions was uh, actually a lot of fun, until they pull the carpet straight out from under you and go for a redemption story arc. Hmm. Really EA? Really DICE? We were promised the Empire's perspective, and instead, by the fourth mission, the main character, one of the Empire's elite, who has been fighting alongside her own family, no less, for years now, suddenly decides to defect to the Rebels. There's no other way of saying this. They dropped the ball on this one. In fact, they dropped the ball, it bounced into a road, and caused a massive car crash, killing many people. Because that's what this is, a car crash. The main character is full of imperialistic fervour one minute, and then defecting the next because some innocent civilians are getting pushed around. Excuse me, Iden, did you hear what happened to Alderaan? It's a very, very, very weak turn in the story, and it's massively disappointing, not only because they had such excellent material to work with in the Star Wars universe, but also because they missed the chance to truly explore the attitudes, motivations, and mindsets of those at the top of the Empire. Instead, we get yet another redemption story arc, much like we're probably going to get from Kylo Ren in The Last Jedi. Only this one won't stand the test of time. Another trick that they missed was the post-Empire plans. A lot of buzz was generated by the trailers around Operation Cinder, which was automatically invoked by Emperor Palpatine after he got thrown into the anus of the exploding Death Star. The game even teases it and leaves you guessing as to what it could be. All of this amounts to nothing at all, however, when you realise that there is no big reveal. Operation Cinder is just simply the destruction of a few planets that were loyal to the Empire. But even this makes very little sense. 
Operation Cinder is introduced as something that will burn away the ideals of rebellion and resistance. But by destroying the planets that are most loyal to you, all it does is reaffirm the belief that the rebellion won and completely defeated the Empire. Now then, we come to the point where we must seek a definition of the word canon, because we were promised that this storyline was going to be canon. Personally, I find that if you pitch a story as canon, it is implying that what is contained in the story is not only part of the established history, but it is also integral to what actually goes on throughout the rest of the story arcs. Now, I'm not disputing that everything that happens in this story is canon in the sense that it is part of the established history. What I'm disputing is what the fuck is it in the story of Iden Versio that is re even remotely important or impactful? Yes, we find out that Luke Skywalker found a strange compass in a cave, and we found out that Iden's husband, Del, was somehow embroiled in Kylo Ren's quest to find Luke before The Force Awakens. But these are really minor, and to call them canon is to me an insult. To put it another way, it's like they did a story about an Ewok having a bath, and called it canon. Well, yes, I'm sure that an Ewok could have a bath at some point in the established history of Star Wars, so in a way it would be canon, but who the fuck cares? To me, when you call something canon, it implies that what happens in the story is going to be important to the history of the overall story as a whole. What's even more insulting about this is that they clearly wanted the heroes to be in the storyline, so they just mashed them in with very little care or thought as to what the purpose was. There are missions with Leia, Luke, Han and Lando and each of them feel like side quests with self-contained mini stories that have little or no impact on anything at all. To be fair, there are a couple of missions that are actually good. The missions with Iden before she defects and one of the final missions where you fight in the Battle of Jakku. Here on Jakku you get the sense of what the potential of this game could have been. One massive planetary battle and you travel around the map in an X-Wing helping the Rebellion complete different objectives while still feeling like you're in the final epic battle to end the war. Personally, I think the Battle of Jakku would have been the perfect setting for an Empire's fighter's story. I may be on my own here, but if I were to write the story myself, I would have the entire thing take place within the Battle of Jakku. Let me set the scene for you. This is the Empire's final battle. The place where it is finally beaten into submission and is forced to run away and hide to lick its wounds. Our anti-hero, Aiden, as head of the Inferno Squad, is tasked with winning the battle and the war for the Empire in one final, last gasp attempt to reclaim control. Aiden traverses the battlefield, aiding and assisting her Stormtrooper allies, but all the while they are still being pushed back, they are still losing. Aiden comes up with a daring plan to try and win the war that needs to be set up in several risky stages. She confronts her father, the Admiral, with her plan, but he doesn't listen. He chooses instead to sacrifice the troops in order to save the Admiralty. Aiden refuses to give in and goes against her father's wishes to try and win the war. She loses some of her comrades along the way, but her drive to see the Empire succeed is too strong to give up. She sees what the Admiralty are capable of against her own troops and begins to question her allegiance to the Empire, but she never questions her allegiance to the troops at her side. Through these missions she is thwarted somewhat by various heroes and iconic rebellion characters but manages to achieve most of her goals through deception, stealth, cunning, brute strength and strategy until finally she is set to spring her trap and win the war but she is confronted by Luke Skywalker who has been tracking her down the whole way. They enter into a terrific battle and Aiden is defeated. Luke spares her life as he can sense the good in Aiden that she doesn't hold the same ideals as her elders that she is a good person but fighting for the wrong side. It ends with the Empire losing the Battle of Jakku and Aiden crestfallen but with the opportunity to change her life by the end of it as she is free from what she owes the Empire and her comrades. Now that's a brief summary that I cooked up in two minutes and in my opinion it's already better than the bathing Ewok that EA and DICE have served us up in Battlefront 2. My story treats characters as real people rather than this childish black and white view of good and evil. It also has something that EA and I seem to have completely forgotten about, which is a fucking boss fight. There are no boss battles in the campaign whatsoever. Also, it has the scope of lasting more than the five hours it took me to complete the story on Battlefront 2. Yes, five hours, that's all you get. Overall, the final score I would give Battlefront 2 is a five out of 10. It would be lower, but the Starfighter Assault brings it up and actually gives you one part of the game that is 
genuinely enjoyable to play. I want to leave you with one final thought though, because this is something that truly irritates me. This is supposed to be a triple A game, and yet everything that I've talked about has already been done well in the past, in what we now class as retro games. If you want a compelling Star Wars storyline, then there is Knights of the Old Republic, which is fantastically well written and will immerse you for hours and hours in a gripping story. If you want an excellent lightsaber combat with different forms and options, then there is Jedi Knight 2 for a story, and Jedi Knight Jedi Academy for online play. If you want better squad based online play in general, then there's Battlefield 4. And finally, if you want a better Battlefront 2, go out and buy Star Wars Battlefront 2 on the PlayStation 2. It's 12 years older than the latest one, but it's just better. So, have you played Battlefront? What, what were your thoughts? Did you enjoy it? What didn't you enjoy? Do you think I'm overreacting? Would you be interested to see an Ewok having a bath? Let me know in the comments and we can talk it through. But as always, I've been Ash, Tug Out. For more videos like this, plus entertaining videos on retro games three times a week, why not subscribe?